I'm sure you already know that iron is super, super important for human health, particularly the ability to carry oxygen through your blood, but even things like the ability to make enough stomach acid or the ability to make enough thyroid hormone. Iron is super important, but I bet you didn't know that about 50% of people with IBS have some degree of iron deficiency. That means there is an incredibly high likelihood that you right here watching this video on YouTube have an iron deficiency problem that you might need to address. But before we get started, I'm going to say iron deficiency can be very tricky to work with. A lot of times people take supplements and they do the right dietary thing and it doesn't budge. They watch their ferritin stay put. So this video is for you folks, the ones who might be stuck in iron deficiency la la land. I'm going to talk about three, no, maybe four things that could be keeping you stuck and what you could do to treat the, treat the problem, find a solution and increase your iron. First and foremost, let's talk about your dang pills because I know you people and you all have supplement piles and supplement graveyards in your cupboard and your counter that are a mile high. So I know you got a bunch of dang pills. So let's talk about those first. There are four minerals that directly compete with iron for absorption and vice versa. So if you take a supplement or if you eat a food with a high amount of one of these minerals at the same time as your dietary or supplemental iron, you're pumping the brakes on your own iron absorption, whether or not you realize that. And this happens pretty commonly. Now, the thing that I will say about this is that it probably happens most when you take the supplement or the food with the iron itself. If you space them out a bit, like I'm going to talk about this one in a second, if you space them out a bit, then they're probably not going to compete a whole ton. So as you can tell, the first one I wanted to bring up is magnesium. This is such a common supplement. It's a wonderful supplement. I have nothing against magnesium. However, it does directly compete with iron for absorption. So this one could be biting you in the butt a little bit. Now, what I personally do, because that's my bottle, I take that a couple nights a week or most nights a week. What I personally do is I take my magnesium at bedtime. So I will eat dinner usually around 5.30 or perhaps 6. Then I'll go to bed at 10.30 or 11. That means that there's been a good solid five hours in between dinner time and when I take the magnesium. And I just did a little bit of an experiment on with my own blood work on this. And I was able to show that it did not impede my iron absorption when I started doing that. So if you space these out by a couple of hours or five hours, like I just said, you're golden. But if I were to take this exact same magnesium supplement with my burger or with my steak or with my spinach, that would probably impede my ability to absorb the iron in those foods. See what I'm getting at here? Now let's get into number two. This can come up in food, but also in supplement form, and it's calcium. You might already know this actually, but I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, not a ton of you are probably taking calcium supplements with the exception of one group of you, postmenopausal women. Oh my goodness. You postmenopausal women love your calcium supplements, and it's not any of your own wrongdoing. It's your doctors who are telling you that you need to take it for your bone health. Now, whether or not there's actually evidence to support that claim is a whole nother story in and of itself. There really isn't much data to support the use of calcium in postmenopausal women for bone health. However, a lot of you are taking calcium, and that's why I wanted to mention this. Calcium, again, Im impedes absorption of iron and vice versa. So if you eat a steak or some eggs or an iron-rich food and you take a calcium supplement, you're going to impede your ability to absorb that iron. Also, sometimes this will come up dietarily. If you're iron deficient, they'll say, well, make sure that you don't pair your iron rich foods with something like milk or a big serving of dairy because the calcium in the dairy is going to decrease your absorption of iron. So there's the calcium story. Now, the other two don't seem like they would be important, but perhaps they are. And they are zinc and copper. And these are all necessary nutrients. I'm not ragging on any of them. I don't think any of them are bad, to be clear. But Zinc and copper are not as frequently supplemented with, with a couple of exceptions. A lot of people take zinc carnosine for the sake of their leaky gut. I love zinc carnosine. It's a wonderful supplement. And I was using it quite a lot at hefty doses until I started really thinking about this interaction with iron. And I've kind of backed off a little bit on my love for that particular supplement. So zinc carnosine is one area where you could see this, or you could see zinc and copper show up in multivitamins. 
And honestly, guys, I don't know quite what to recommend here because I do like having the insurance policy of a multivitamin, but I also don't want to interfere with the absorption of stuff. That seems kind of silly. So I'm kind of working on this in my own way because my ferritin's been a little bit subpar in recent years. And I'm working on one experiment right now. My current experiment is HCL and bitters. Even though I don't really have symptoms of low stomach acid, I'm playing with that for a few months. If that doesn't make an impact on my ferritin, the next one I think I'm gonna play with is my multivitamin. And I might just swap it out for a B complex and leave the minerals out of the equation entirely, give that three months and see if that turns the ship around and brings up my ferritin. So I'm gonna put a little pin in this one. I'll come back and tell you about this in about six months. But my, my point here is that maybe we need to be just a teensy weensy little bit cautious around the use of multivitamins, which again, kind of stresses me out because I love multivitamins. So for what it's worth, those are the other two. Now let's get into number two. This one goes out to all the ladies out there, particularly the pre-menopausal ladies. And that is if you have a heavy menstrual flow, I'm gonna to try to draw you a uterus just on the fly right now. And some fallopian tubes. There we go. If you have a really heavy menstrual flow, you're gonna be losing more blood than the average woman. Keep in mind that when they set up RDAs, when they set up the recommended daily allowances for each nutrient, you might be hitting the mark on that nutrient, but that RDA is set to cover most normal people. They might not be, it might not be enough iron to cover you if you're going through a super tampon and a super pad every single hour for a couple of days in your period. So getting a sense of A, is my period super heavy? Is this normal or abnormal? To get a sense of that, I would just say, talk with a bunch of your girlfriends and see, you know, just talk about it in that context. I'm not gonna share my period stuff on YouTube. That just seems like a little bit TMI to share here on a YouTube video, even though I am a pretty open book. Uh, but talk with your girlfriends, get a sense of, oh, is my period really heavy or, or is it normal? Then if your period is really heavy, working on the hormone piece of it or working to identify why that is might be really helpful. For some women, it might be that you have endometriosis or estrogen dominance and you could work on that. For some of you, maybe you don't have either of those conditions, but taking an herb like shepherd's purse, which is available in a tincture, might be really, really helpful for slowing down that, help, that heavy flow and preserving your iron so that you can more quickly and more readily replenish it through your dietary and nutritional strategies. So heavy periods is a big number two. Now, number three easily could have been number one, but I didn't want to lead with it because it's the one that none of you want to hear. Insufficient intake, people. I'm going to scream from the rooftops for another time. I don't know, how do I depict this? Just a down arrow. If you're not eating enough iron, you're never going to get your iron up. And I say this and I laugh about it because this is such a common issue. I have seen many people who come to me and they're totally befuddled and they don't know why they're iron deficient. And then we do a dang chronometer report. Chronometer is an app that does nutrition tracking and you can use it and assess your iron for free, by the way. We do a chronometer report and it turns out that they're nowhere near the RDA for iron. So literally the whole strategy to this person who thinks that they have bowel absorption and they're freaking out, they're bugging out, they don't know what to do. They think that they need an, uh, an infusion. The whole strategy is, just eat more iron, and then that corrects the issue. Now, there are two populations of people where I find that this is a little bit, um, I don't know what I wanna call it, not tricky, but maybe a sore spot, or maybe some people who would be a little bit more reluctant to really take this one seriously. One is the group of folks, particularly with SIBO, who think, no, it's not an intake thing, I just have malabsorption. Like I was told that I have malabsorption, SIBO causes malabsorption, I read that, and that's why my iron is in the tank, so I'm not even gonna bother with chronometer. To those folks, I would say, please, please track your nutrition, use chronometer, just see, it's free, you can use it so easily. Um, check it out because again, a lot of people come to me and they think they have malabsorption and that's why their iron is in the toilet and then I prove to them that no, that is not the case. So don't be one of those people who just thinks you have the answer and you're not going to investigate it any further because you already know what the answer is, for one. 
Number two, this is the one that's, you, the people I'm talking to with this next one, you're probably gonna come for me with pitchforks, but hear me out, vegans and vegetarians. I'm gonna say this first by letting you know, I myself was a vegetarian for 11 years, and I'm not a super heavy meat eater to this day. So I'm not anti-vegetarians and vegans, I'm not like trying to attack you and your nutritional beliefs or whatever. But I just want to let you know that the RDA for iron is 1.8 times higher in vegetarians and vegans compared to people who eat meat. And the reason for this is it has been a long-standing, widely known truth in the nutritional realm or we don't know anything, right? So like, I guess I shouldn't say truth. That comes off as a little bit judgy. It has been widely held as true in the scientific and nutritional community for many, many years and decades that heme iron, animal sources of iron, are much more bioavailable than plant-based sources. So you can eat all the spinach on planet Earth and you might not get enough of the bioavailable iron to meet your iron needs. So that's why the RDA, is set so much higher for vegans and vegetarians. So for a woman who's of menstruating age and has a period, normally the RDA for my, my age group, like I think it's 18 to 50 year old women, normally the RDA for that age group is 18 milligrams of iron per day. And I will say that is genuinely hard to do. I have a hard time doing that and I do eat meat. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, however, the RDA shoots up to 32 milligrams per day, which is an astronomical amount. And it's worth noting, keep in mind, if you want to raise the level of a nutrient, you don't just need the RDA. The RDA is to meet your current needs, not correct a deficit. So if you're iron deficient and you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you're gonna need some number way above and beyond 32 milligrams of iron every single day. And that is incredibly challenging to do. And again, like I find it difficult to meet the RDA for iron and my RDA is set lower because I do eat meat. Mine's only 18 milligrams and I do nutrition tracking on myself all the time and I do this for a living. So if I have a hard time meeting my lower RDA, I can't even imagine trying to correct an iron deficiency on a vegan or vegetarian diet. It just, it becomes really stinking difficult to do. So if you're open to it, I would suggest not necessarily that you have to go eat a burger or a big old bloody steak. I get that that's not appealing to you, but perhaps look into something like eating some seafood, maybe eating bivalves or, you know, uh, crab or shrimp, maybe eggs, like eating something that's not a big hunk of animal meat, if that's not your jam, but perhaps eating something that has heme iron, is more bioavailable, but still can meet some of your, your ethical and moral reasons for being a vegetarian or vegan. I think that might be the answer for a lot of you. Now, four, the reason why I crossed out four is this one is slightly more theoretical, but there's a couple of cool research studies that I'm gonna link in the description down below, and I thought it was worth noting. I'm wondering, based on these, these couple of studies, if a low fiber or a low FODMAP diet I uh, don't re remember how to spell FODMAP apparently. I'm now wondering if a low fiber or a low FODMAP diet could contribute to iron deficiency, and here's why. I found some cool research studies, one where they used a yogurt, one was a normal yogurt, one was a yogurt mixed with a prebiotic blend, and the other one they used inulin, and these were human studies. And in both of those studies, the prebiotic increased the absorption of iron. In the case of the probiotic and with the prebiotic yogurt combo, the group that had the prebiotic mixed in their yogurt had an increase in iron absorption of about 50%, which is pretty huge. In the inulin only study, I think it increased by about 14%, which they did say was, was statistically significant. So if, and here's my logic on this, if adding fiber or adding FODMAP fiber like inulin increases the absorption of iron, doesn't it stand to reason that taking away our prebiotic sources and our FODMAP sources might decrease iron? 
right? Like if, if the relationship seems to be true going one direction, then the converse is probably true as well. So I'm hypothesizing now low FODMAP and low fiber diets in general might be another one that can in decrease your iron absorption and keep you stuck in iron deficiency. Of course, I know what you might be saying. You might be like, cool lady, I want to eat more fiber and FODMAPs and onions, but I can't because my gut goes wackadoo and I feel like crap, pun intended. So am I just doomed to be iron deficient for the rest of my days? No, no, you're not. And here's the reason why, because we've got solutions. I've got solutions for you, not only here on YouTube and my podcast, but also FODMAP Freedom. FODMAP Freedom is my group coaching program and it's opening really soon. Our last enrollment period for the year is going to open up on August 14th to the folks on the wait list. And we're going to go through the fall coaching you through all of this stuff, all the stuff you need to know and all the stuff that you need to be coached on to heal your gut and feel better is in FODMAP Freedom. And if it's not, if you go through the program and you put in the effort and your tummy doesn't feel better, I will give you 100% of your investment back. That's how confident I am that this course can help you. Come join us on the Q&As. We've got live Q&As throughout the week. I personally am on the live Q&As basically for the entire afternoon, every single Friday. And it, it, you come in, it's like office hours. You ask questions, you can engage, you can help people out if you want to participate in the conversation. My FODMAP Freedom Coach, who's a nutritionist who works with me, she has multiple Q&As throughout the week as well. But come join us. We have great coaches, we have great support, and a great little community, and we get people results. So if you want to join the waitlist, I'm going to put the link down below. Just so you know, the waitlist, there's no commitment. You don't have to give a credit card or anything like that. All you're doing is giving me your email address and saying, hey, I want first dibs. Because what happens is I open up enrollment for the waitlist first for a full week before I let loose to the rest of my community and post it here on YouTube or email or Instagram. So you have a full week, you can look at the materials, you can look at the page about FODMAP Freedom, watch the testimonials, you can even book a free discovery call with our FODMAP Freedom coach to talk about the program and whether or not you're a good fit. Then after a week has gone by on August 21st, I'm going to post the link here on YouTube and Instagram and more to like my general audience. So if you want that heads up and you want more of a time to decide and you want to get the super awesome bonus that comes with early enrollment, I'd encourage you to join the waitlist now. You won't regret it. And I really hope I get to see you in FODMAP Freedom soon. Come to the dark side because we've got onions. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.